Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good um, break and were able to get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Um, so let us proceed with our fourth and final session today, which will uh, thus conclude the, the two-day uh, session on developing a career in bioethics and health law. So um, our last session is about career opportunities in bioethics and health law. So thinking about how you uh, make use of your master's degree, your PhD, uh, postdoc and starting to develop a, a career path in, in bioethics and health law. So to that end, we're absolutely delighted to have two speakers with us today, uh, Mary Guy and Simon Woods, and I'll introduce them both now. So Dr. Mary Guy is a lecturer in law at uh, Lancaster University's Law School, and her research focuses on healthcare reform. Um, and she's particularly interested in healthcare regulation, healthcare systems organization, uh, EU health law and policy and comparative law. And I know she's one of the foremost experts in EU health law. So we're delighted to have her uh, with us today. And then Professor Simon Woods, who's a professor of bioethics at Newcastle University and also the, the executive director of PEELS, which is Policy, Ethics and Life Sciences, the research center at Newcastle University. And Simon's uh, is a philosopher who works in bioethics, medical ethics and social philosophy. And his research interests include medical technology, genomics, big data for healthcare, uh, and he continues to have a strong research interest in research ethics, end of life issues, and the patient experience. So, couldn't have better better speakers talk about career career opportunities uh, in these two domains. So, Simon and Mary, over to you. Thanks, Ted. <clears throat> um, Mary and I uh, were interested in um, who we're speaking to today because it's very difficult on these Zoom meetings to get a feel for where for where people are at. So I think Mary, you had a couple of questions you wanted to put to the group, didn't you? Yes, um, I was wondering. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we were just wanting to get a sense of who's in the audience, um, what stage you're at, um, what you'd like to get from this session. Um, I wonder if we could just pop the questions in the chat. I know we've got quite a large audience, so it may work or not. Let me just find the questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've got a first year PhD exploring novel genomic negligent ethics and tort law, negligence theories, that's great. So I'm just popping the three questions. Oh, okay, these are coming through now, that's great. So um, I think how we spoke about running this session, um, Simon, was, um, Simon would talk first more from the bioethics perspective and then I'd follow up from the health law perspective. Can you see the responses coming through, Simon? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so we're getting a real range here, and that's that's fantastic. So from first year PhD through to um, <clears throat> continuing beyond PhD, oh, sorry, LLM candidates as well, fantastic. And also um, within the UK and beyond, so that's fantastic. Okay, so hopefully between um, what we cover, there's going to be something for everyone in this session and we have Q&A at the end and obviously very happy to follow up outside this forum as well, if that's useful. Okay, I'm just going to uh, close my door because I'm in competition with the seagulls. So just, <laughs> just a second. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, of the... Um, there's a new PhD in Ireland, that's great. Um, so certainly some of the things I'm going to talk about will relate primarily to UK academia, but hopefully there'll, there'll be um, things you can take from that for other jurisdictions as well. Okay, so shall I go first? Yeah, yeah. I'll just do the screen share. Okay, is that, um, yeah. 
just wanted to do it automatically. Is that visible to everybody? Yep, that works. Okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> my, uh, my talk about is going to focus on bioethics, as, as, um, as Mary said. And uh, I'm not sure whether I fulfilled the remit that I was asked to fulfill for today, because actually it's quite, it's quite a difficult subject, I realized. So hopefully the way I've packaged this together will, will, will pr provoke some reflections and, and thoughts and possibly some questions. But um, I suppose if anybody knows how to build a career in bioethics, it should be uh, a professor of bioethics. But I guess that my challenge was on reflection. I wasn't quite sure if that was by luck or by design. So I guess all of you at various, uh, the various stages you're at in your career are facing the kind of crossroads about which way to go and how to develop that career. And in my talk today, I'm going to say something about, well, first of all, what is bioethics? What's the context we're working in? And I mulled this one over for a while, but I, I think we do have to face some of the harsh realities about what an academic career in bioethics um, looks like and the challenges that it represents. But also I want to go on to look at a different way of thinking about success and how one maintains an interest in, in career development and also having fun in a subject that is, after all, fascinating, stimulating, provoking. And okay, it may not be a barrel of laughs all the time, but it's certainly something which is enjoyable and a pleasure to engage with. And I guess most of you have already made the decision that you're that way inclined by being at the stage you are in your careers. So, just to uh, steal somebody else's uh, thought cloud on what bioethics is. Well, I think everybody who's in the field recognizes that it, that it isn't one single thing, that, that I guess the thing that distinguishes bioethics for me is it's highly um, interdisciplinary. And that interdisciplinarity is both a challenge and, um, and a strength, I suppose. It's a challenge and an opportunity. So, <clears throat> you know, what I'm going to say, I think, is playing on what dealing with the diverse and interdisciplinary nature of bioethics might require in terms of um, a skill set for a career development in the field. Um, but as I said earlier, the, there are some kind of harsh realities to face, and the next couple of slides will deal with the harsh realities and then. Hopefully, it will open up into a more optimistic um, outlook. I think one thing to kind of reflect on when building a career, and obviously I'm looking at it from one end of the career um, line to um, perhaps most of you are, but um, there are multiple different kinds of entry points. I'm no doubt reflecting on your own position, you will have gone through a bachelor degree, a master's degree. Many of you are starting a PhD or advanced in a PhD. But also it's possible to come into bioethics through, through um, work routes as a health professional or a lawyer, a scientist. And indeed, you know, I've encountered many colleagues who have come into bioethics through those routes, albeit they've had the bachelor and master's degree, but in other subject areas. And I guess I fit into that mold myself because although I have a background in philosophy, I was also a health professional. I spent 10 years as a cancer nurse and work, worked in the NHS. And on reflecting about entry points, there's also a number of exit points that it's not all into academia, but it could be into the area of policy, of, of NGOs, of journalism, or of health professional practice, law and science practice. All of these areas are, I think, legitimate contributors to bioethics, but whether you characterize this as a career in bioethics, I think is part of the challenge. And then there's the kind of rarer breed, which is the person who wants to go into an academic career, um, 
with a focus on bioethics, but having inevitably to face one of the three possible roles that lead to a career in academia. And I'll just say a little bit about what they are. The teaching and scholarship, the teaching and research, the research and innovation role. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking very much from the position in the UK at the moment, but I think if you're not based in the UK, you will still recognize these categories and these structures because they're, I think they're, they're global. Oops, got a bit of a glitch. So in the academic route for, a, for, a, for um, developing a career, then there are three distinct roles, teaching and scholarship, research and innovation, teaching and research. And I guess <laughs> teaching is fun and very interesting, but it can be all consuming and the opportunities for teaching are very limited. I think people who are in teaching roles find it difficult to do research and to publish. Perhaps the next more common experience is that of research and innovation. This is a um, very exciting, stimulating, but really there isn't a career structure, certainly in UK universities to stay in the research and innovation role. So these are people who are working as uh, um, research associates on research projects. And, you know, in my own career, I've been in and out of these roles. I've supported people in these roles. And indeed the center in which I work in has been built up on the work of these individuals. But the, the, the permanent and progressive academic role is, you know, what I've called the core academic role is the one of teaching and research, which combines teaching and scholarship on a, um, hopefully a tenured academic role. This is the, this is the increasingly challenging and elusive role that one aims for, but, it, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's not easy to get these positions. And thinking about developing an ac academic career with this goal in mind might involve taking on one or other of these roles at different stages in one's career. But I guess the thing that faces us all is that the permanent post in academia, the tenured post, depends on uh, your ability to produce the kind of outputs, impact and research quality that, that's now of premium price in academia. In the UK, we've just been through the process of the research excellence framework. And those of you in the UK will know what that's about, but increasingly wherever you are, academics are under scrutiny to produce this. This is the, the kind of Tyrannosaurus Rex that's chasing us down. Um, and it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on those coming into the field, I think, to perform in the right way. There is a culture of performativity and scrutiny that makes it very difficult to develop a career in um, towards a tenured post in academia. There's no two ways about it. And, I'm afraid that's the harsh reality. But what I would talk about now are the different strategies one might take to um, outpace the dinosaur, if you like, and to build up um, something like a portfolio career that, that leads to success in different ways. I suppose one way I think about it is that one needs to create a kind of portmanteau or portfolio of, um, of a, a career profile. So building a solid base is probably recognizing that you have certain um, attributes in particular areas, whether that's law or philosophy or any of the other disciplines that feed into bioethics. But perhaps on top of that is developing a set of transferable skills that can move between the different contexts in which bioethics takes place. And I think ultimately try and pack for adventure to be able to think that you could move between one area and another with a set of skills that are going to appeal to that particular area. And I think that most people who have 
developed a career in bioethics have been using transferable skills and packing for adventure by taking a, um, um, a punt on a, a new area of research interest, for example. It's certainly what I've had to do in my career and my colleagues um, have had similar experiences. I think also about the kind of attributes that one needs to be successful. And here I'm <laughs> I mentioned three kinds of attribute. The field of bioethics just doesn't sit in one world. It's, it's being able to imagine oneself in multiple different worlds. So I think about how I came into bioethics where I guess the focus was very much on medical ethics and the kinds of challenges that one recognized coming out of clinical practice. But I've hopped between different kinds of worlds into the world of genetics and genomics and now into um, boundary breaking biosciences that have little in common with uh, the, my original interest in in clinical ethics and medical ethics. So being prepared to, to shift into a parallel world where those transferable skills are useful, I think is a, an important attribute. The second attribute is that of the chameleon, being able to blend in with a background. And again, I think this is about this portmanteau of transferable skills where one can turn those skills to new, new contexts, new areas of inquiry. And because of the interdisciplinary nature of bioethics, you know, I think this is a really important attribute. That's not to lose touch with one's original kind of academic background, but recognizing that, that blending into an environment is an important attribute. And that the final attribute I want to focus on is, uh, Unfortunately, the animation is not working on that, but <laughs> this is the juggling octopus. I think with all those skills that one develops in that portmanteau uh, approach I was talking about, one has to keep agile and able to, to juggle them in different ways. And these are just different, I guess, ways of focusing on the, the kind of skill set that's important to survive in the field of bioethics research. Because bioethics is not tied uh, in any particular way to a single discipline. <clears throat> On a more positive note, I think the things that really lead to success are uh, the following things I'll talk about. So one is building a network and building a network builds connections with important colleagues, it brings opportunities and I can only talk about um, uh, this briefly but um, Happy to respond to any questions later. But this, the network can be anything from creating you know, informal research meetings or brown bag lunches where different colleagues can talk about their research interests and early ideas, to bigger networks like the very successful Northern Bioethics Network that um, many of the colleagues who are here today are members of. Um, and this was based on a small grant won by Sarah Chan from the Wellcome Trust. And, enabled a pump priming of uh, a new network of bioethics scholars. The point is that getting involved in, in these networks is highly valuable, but the models are operating at different size and different scales. So I've benefited myself from trying out a new research idea to brown bag lunch, but also being involved in um, an international collaborative network, which has moved on to get research funding, to publish an anthology and so on. So these networks cultivated in different scales and different sizes are really important to building the kind of collegiate network that one needs to be successful in bioethics. Second area is to take the opportunities to respond, comment and collaborate on all the issues that are, that are raising in, in the bioethics field. And I've just here, list, I've just created a kind of montage of different opportunities, but the public consultations and the, um, uh, the wider consultations 
by bodies such as the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority or the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, the Parliamentary Science and Technology Committee or all the equivalent organizations in other countries. These are excellent opportunities to work with colle colleagues to, to comment and in doing so one makes new connections and develops new skills and gets new insights into how to influence and shape debates around important bioethical issues. So responding, commenting and collaborating is an important skill set. Of course, publishing is absolutely essential to develop an academic career. And, you know, there we all know the key journals in the field that, um, that are signifiers of success, but there are also multiple other ways in which publishing can be important. So it's not just about producing the single monograph, but there are sold authored papers and multi authored papers, both academic and, and other. Although I'm not a great aficionado of blogs and Twitter, they, they are important avenues for beginning to build up a, a publishing profile. And I think one of the examples, and I hope my colleague doesn't mind me mentioning her, Alex Patton was a PhD student with us at Peels and has gone on to develop her own career as, a, as an academic <clears throat> at Ashton University. But Alex has been very successful at, uh, at blogging and writing for the independent newspaper and generally taking different ways of developing her profile and showing the expertise that she has, has in a way that has fed back into her career development. So it's always nice to look to uh, role models of success in these domains. Conferences are in of course also important ways of building up networks. Uh, they're both avenues for outputs of your work, but also they're places for networking and making friends. And that's one of the things I think has been so badly damaged by the pandemic experience. Um, the opportunity to actually meet face to face with people and to create new contacts. And again, here I've pointed to some of the, you know, the major conferences in the field, the International Association of Bioethics is often, you know, the, the conference that most bioethicists would want to attend and present at. But also there are other opportunities like the, the Feminist Association of Bioethics, usually happens at the same time as the IAB, but it's, it's a much more intimate um, conference where one can develop a different kind of contact. And I think I enjoy both those experiences. So conferences aren't necessarily the big international uh, events. They can be smaller and more intimate and lead to productive networks and alliances that are so beneficial to developing that career. And an area that I think is crucial to the field of bioethics is a capacity for engaging publics. And it's something that we've been successful, successful um, at in Peels through our longstanding thing, events like uh, Cafe Scientifique or Ethics in the Pub, but also formal debates and panels with um, international speakers can be part of an engaging public um, profile. But I think that, that the ability to take our work outside of the academy is a crucial part of, of bioethics and it's a key factor in, the, in that kind of successful skill set that I was talking about earlier, the portable portmanteau approach to, to academic skills that one needs. And then of course other forms of engagement work. This set of photographs is some work that we did in a local um, uh, museum where we had contact with up to 3,000 members of the public and it was a very simple way of engaging families um, but our target was ostensibly the parents I suppose in getting them to explore the issues of new science like synthetic biology for example. So kids building a, a clock began to understand how cells were being engineered um, in synthetic biology. And also the exhibitions and artistic collaborations 
are an important avenue for that kind of wider engagement and bringing the ideas of bioethics to wider, to wider audiences. And again, I've just used two examples of work that we've done on, on the left side with, with artists working with scientists to produce artwork that mimics the science um, that's being done. And the exhibition provides a place of engaging between science publics and bioethicists to discuss those issues. And similarly on the right here is a, a program of creative writing and poetry making around uh, the science of, um, well, it was called stemistry, but the focus was on genomics and evolutionary genetics and um, stem cell biology um, in which um, the poetry was a point of engagement with complex science, but it is an avenue that, that, that led to a very rich kind of bioethics profile. So these are the fun and interesting aspects of bioethics that I think any bioethicist needs to consider how they can bring these skill sets into the career profile. And then finally, I think, you know, this is a, a photograph from a display that we had to celebrate Peel's 20th anniversary. And it, it made me realize that over the 20 year history of Peel's, that it, the, our interest has moved from topic to topic. And here, this is broadly a kind of genomics history that Peel's work has been engaged with, but it reinforces the fact that it, it takes time to build a career and that what one is focused on now doing your PhD may not be where you find yourself in five or 10 years time. So I think it's important to build up a, um, a portfolio of those different skill sets that I've alluded to. If nothing else, um, it leads to um, a fun and interest in the subject that's, that can be maintained rather than the kind of slog of chasing an academic career that is trying to outpace the dinosaur. So I hope, I hope what I've said isn't being too um, off piste, but I'm happy to take some questions or to uh, see any comments in the, in the chat. And thanks for listening. Many thanks indeed, Simon, for that. Uh, Mary, did you wanna uh, go right into your uh, portion of the session, or did you want to, uh, Simon, take some questions on the bioethics focus now? I'm happy for Simon to take questions if he wants to now. That's fine. Well, sure, if there are any. I mean, it might, have, you, have you been posting questions in the chat? I think Anne-Marie's been posting some comments and some tips uh, in the course of the um, uh, of your presentation, um, but we also can receive questions. Now, we also have time uh, following okay. Mary's presentation for Q&A, so... Um, uh, I see. I see. There is a question that's come in, so I'll leave that to you, Simon. Okay. The 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 teaching and scholarship category. The, I mean, this is um, this is something that uh, um, is framed in um, UK academia, but essentially it means somebody who is focused on teaching and their scholarship supports the teaching. It's it's. It's, um, I guess it's a, an academic pathway that has been designed to fulfill universities need to teach students. And um, it's, it's certainly an opportunity, but it's um, frustrating in the sense that um, one's time gets easily gobbled up by teaching and leaves little, little opportunity for research. So the teaching and scholarship role is really a teaching role. Maybe we'll just that last question from Magdalena and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll save the questions for the Q&A following Mary's, but by all means, Simon, if you want to answer that last yeah, question. Yeah, sure. I mean, and this is, this is part of the academic reality that REF is, is about research active scholars and not necessarily about people who are focused on teaching. So it's a rather artificial, dis I, I think it's an artificial way of distinguishing between those scholars who are also researchers um, and who qualify to be evaluated in the ref. I think it's it's rather a it's rather a pernicious distinction. I think, but 
in my humble opinion. Yeah, but I'd be happy to come back to that if people want to bring it up later. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, uh, colleagues, please uh, do write down your questions and, and Amri and I can help field them during the Q&A uh, portion to follow. But um, Mary, why don't we turn it over to you now? Yeah, okay, that's great. I'll just share my slides. Um, try. Okay, can you see those okay? Yep. Yep, okay, great. Um, well, I'll start by thanking Ted and Amory and the Mason Institute for the invitation to talk to you all um, today. Um, as uh, Ted mentioned, um, I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University. I've been there approximately four and a half years now. Uh, time flies. Um, it's one of the things I'd say. Um, before that, I did a PhD at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and I was part of the Centre for Competition Policy. So um, I have built a career around making a move between being seen as a competition lawyer to being seen more as a health lawyer. Um, and so I'm going to be commenting a little bit on that. One of the questions I had as a PhD student is which are you, a competition lawyer or health lawyer? My PhD um, looked at competition reforms in Dutch and English healthcare. Um, and one of the virtues that can come of that is presenting your research to a range of different audiences. Um, it can help improve your research. It can also help enormously in building a profile which as Simon's indicated, is obviously an important aspect of developing a career. Um, I'm going to be drawing together some of the themes um, you'll have no doubt touched on in other sessions as well. Um, a little bit on publications, a little bit on funding, these sorts of things. Um, I'm going to be talking probably mostly about the UK experience, so I hope a lot of that will be transferable. Um, I will be mentioning a couple of other points as I go through as well, though. So to begin with, um, I thought I'd open with a question that I got shortly after starting at Lancaster, which is what sort of health lawyer are you? Um, which I thought was a bit of a curious question. But when you think about how broad the discipline of health law is, what it encompasses, it's actually not that surprising um, a question. I've flagged some of the topics that can typically come up, that might come up. Um, so you, it could be that your focus is on some of the subjects which may typically fit within a broad category of medical law, either, um, for example, organ donation, for example, um, end of life issues. Um, it may be that your focus is more on questions of regulation or policy. You could be engaging with distinctions between health in the sense of public health and healthcare in the sense of healthcare system organization. Could be you're taking a comparative focus or looking at sort of wider healthcare system. So moving beyond any sort of sense of a national health um, law and policy, either looking at EU level or global level. And in a sense, these can feature in either teaching or research. Um, one aspect I've not mentioned here um, it would be pharmaceutical regulation, it's something that would, to the outside um, or, to, or to many disciplines, would fit within health, but maybe within health law is something that um, has an interesting place. So, in answer to the question of what sort of health lawyer are you asking, what do you do? So, it's it's coming down to this idea of a profile, and. It matters in that different institutions are going to have a different focus, a slightly different emphasis in their sort of research interests. Some will be broader than others. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if what you do is seems quite different to a research institute that you'd be unwelcome. It could be a benefit for all concerned, there's a chance to expand. And that different aspects of health law can work in different ways for teaching and research. So in terms of this idea of building a career, um, as Simon's mentioned, and particularly if you're looking at a sort of, if you like, typical academic career, um, it's going to be ideally focusing on teaching and research. Um, although um, 
many PhD students move on to teaching and scholarship contracts initially. Um, it's worth thinking about where you fit within broader definitions of health law and policy, um, both from the point of view of teaching and from the point of view of research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching, um, first of all. I've, as far as the visuals go, I was looking for art that relates, that reflects um, sort of health law and policy in one way or another. Um, so there isn't some hidden linkages in the pictures. So with regard to teaching, um, obviously, if you're in an institution where there are a range of health related modules, hopefully you'll have experience to teach on those um, as PhD students. I realise in the current environment, teaching opportunities um, may be particularly restricted for PhD students. Hopefully that will re-emerge at some point. Um, from my own experience, where teaching um, opportunities were limited, um, I um, decided to use that time to present work as much as possible. So if it wasn't possible to teach, then at least I could get to a place where I felt comfortable talking to academic audiences about my research. And in turn, that fed into opportunities to give guest lectures on undergraduate modules. So as I say, I started at UEA. So um, thanks to Professor Rob Haywood, who runs the medical law module there, um, I could give guest lectures on my research for two years running and also cover themes that he didn't typically include. So for example, patient confidentiality. So in some ways, building a profile involves looking for the gaps, seeing where you can fit in and add value. Um, with building an academic career, certainly in UK universities, you, there's going to be an emphasis on what core subjects you teach as well. Um, again, there may not be a choice available there will be a need for support in particular modules um, and that may vary year on year so an obvious connection is taught um, possibly less directly obvious um cause could include public law criminal law eu law is an interesting one um, and contract law so there may be scope within those to bring in some insights from your research but if not, you are obviously building the experience you would need to be able to um, put together a strong application for a first lecturer post. Another aspect, of course, is identifying opportunities. So what can you offer um, from your research interests? What can you contribute to existing health law modules if you're in an institution where that's a possibility? So this might be in terms of how you teach, for example, if you're particularly comfortable using sort of more digital and online um, formats, which obviously we're all becoming more familiar with that. It could be in terms of the perspective you bring to things. So this year on healthcare law and ethics um, at Lancaster, um, I've been giving the lectures on IVF, for example. So IVF, it's not, obviously linked with my research. Um, so one aspect I've mentioned briefly, in addition to the um, more fundamental aspects of I the law surrounding IVF, has been the interaction between the NHS and private healthcare with regard to accessing IVF. Could it be that you could design a module based on your research area, if you work on something like mental health law, for example? Um, and would this be at undergraduate level or postgraduate level? It may be that um, many research areas lend themselves more to postgraduate level study rather than undergraduate, but that's not necessarily always the case. So in a sense, building a teaching perspective can be about looking for the, the opportunities. Where is the scope for guest lectures? Where can you join um, discussion groups in related subjects? Um, if you're in a, based in a law school, does it have connections with a medical school? If there's a medical school at your institution, are the health economists working in your institution? Would they be interested in hearing about the areas you're working on? So um, from my own perspective, obviously I've um, 
mentioned already given guest lectures at UEA at Lancaster. I teach on the healthcare law and ethics module, so I'm fort very fortunate to be able to work with Professor Sarah Fovarg and Professor Suzanne Ost on that. And um, for the next academic year, I'm designing a postgraduate module on law and global health. So in the sense of trying to understand how that fits in, um, at Lancaster, we don't have master's level programs in health. It's something we're revisiting. So I'm positioning a module on law and global health to be of interest to students who are taking modules on international human rights law, for example, who may be doing more commercial subjects as well. So again, maybe stepping back and thinking about where your research may fit with other subjects. Okay, so obviously with teaching, um, if you're looking at working in UK institutions, you'll be looking to um, gain associate fellowship of the Higher Education Academy as well. And having some sort of reflective practice, um, seeing who um, can observe your teaching and who you can observe in turn. So it's a, it's, it's a long process. It's, a, it's all steps along the way. But moving into research, obviously, ideally, we can think about research or teaching as well. But research, um, just to largely reiterate um, what Simon said, um, I can't understate the importance of networking um, in terms of building a profile. And that can take place at different levels and in different ways. Um, some of the larger associations, the larger conferences, in, um, in law in the UK would be Society of Legal Scholars, SLS, and Socio-Legal Scholars Association, SLSA, both of which have healthful streams. So if you're not familiar with those, I'm sure many of you will be, um, worth looking into. Societies also have postgraduate streams as well. Um, another body you may have encountered is the European Association for Health Law. So they tend to have um, large conferences every other year, other events in the meantime. Um, increasingly, law schools host PhD conferences run by PhD students for PhD students. Um, and these can be a very good place, particularly if you're in the sort of earlier stages of your PhD to build up um, um, confidence and familiarity with the experience of presenting your work. Another um, grouping maybe of interest if you're doing comparative work is the British Association for Comparative Law and in other countries equivalent societies will exist. Um, I mentioned this because it was something I found particularly helpful. So again it's about thinking about how to make your research accessible to as wide an audience as possible. Feedback from that can benefit your research in different ways. So although you may be the only person in the room talking about health, you're then known as somebody who does health. So you're starting to build a profile by virtue of your focus. Um, that said, there can be benefits from hearing from people working on other subjects, but using similar methodologies as well. So in thinking of um, methodology, maybe looking at a comparative focus, maybe looking more interdisciplinary work, that's something I'm um, working more on at the moment. Um, uh, some of my EU health law work has been in connection with um, Dr. Eleanor Brooks of Edinburgh, who's a political scientist. We're now working with Dr. Charlotte Kudzuski, who's a sociologist at Aston. And that's this, this sort of work has led to me being invited to write um, a book chapter in connection with other authors who are mainly sociologists. So that's a very interesting experience to be involved with at the moment. Um, Simon mentioned that obviously in the current climate, um, our opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction have been sort of curtailed. And that is a great shame, um, but it's enabled events such as this to, to really take off. And that's been one of the um, rare benefits in the current situation. I've also set up a virtual seminar series called Health in Europe, 
that might be of interest to some of you if you're working on um, maybe EU themes, but more generally as well. You'll be able to see from the, our programme this term that we're having a broader focus coming through. <coughs> so, networking, obviously, very important to building a profile. So, in putting together a CV, if you're thinking of applying for lecturing roles, you're probably going to have a list of your presentations and a list of publications. And these will be developing as you go through your PhD. So depending on your area, it may be um, that you can write a range of case notes. This can be a good way to raise your profile, become associated with as the expert on a particular area of law. Could be that you write book reviews. These can be useful for learning how to write in academic journals. Uh, Simon mentioned already contributing to parliamentary consultations again. Um, a consultation by different bodies um, can be a useful thing to become involved in as well. So other aspects, um, it's worth, if you haven't already, um, becoming aware of um, the press office at your institution. So become one of the people they may contact for, for quotes or comments on a particular item in the news or particular events as they happen. Also blog posts can be um, a useful writing exercise, useful for getting your work out, getting your name out there. It can be a blog institution, sorry, blog posts organized by your own institution um, or organizations such as The Conversation. It can be useful if you've not uh, worked with them already. Um, collaborating can be an important uh, part of getting initial publications. It may be with your supervisors, it may be with others. So um, some institutions encourage supervisors to write with their PhD students. Um, the collaborations I've been involved in have been, as it happens, with Dutch professors, one of whom was my external examiner. It's led to a very fruitful working relationship which um, continues um, to this day and going forward. We've mentioned the dreaded ref already a couple of times. This is very much a UK thing, <laughs> um, but there will be, I'm sure, equivalent assessment frameworks for research in other countries as well. So with the ref, um, one of the focuses is on producing work which, is origin which has originality, significance and rigor. So this is often, a separate criteria to what journals may be looking for. It's a sort of additional level. It can be a, an additional level of assessment of your work. So, and one of the things which came to light when I was working on a PhD was the question of whether or not to turn your PhD into a monograph. I'm sure you've had discussions about this yesterday. Unfortunately, I can attend that session. Um, all I'll say on this is that it's ultimately a very personal decision. It could be that your work fits better as a monograph. That was the case for me. Um, I had a study which looked at EU competition or sectoral regulation and hospital mergers, each of which worked as a chapter within a wider book. I think trying to get an article published on hospital mergers would have been very difficult. It, it would be a very specialist subject on mastermind, very niche subject on mastermind. It would probably be too much about healthcare for competition lawyers, probably too much about competition for health lawyers. So um, that was one of the reasons I turned my PhD into a monograph. Other benefits have been being in a position to make applications um, for funding bids. Um, in the UK, the focus is very, can be very much on impact of your research other funding bodies, that's less of the case. So European level grants have a focus, can have a focus on um, scientific knowledge. So the idea of the state of the art and what the contribution you make to that. Arguably, it's easier to be able to point to a monograph and say, uh, this is the contribution I've made in addition to the articles that you've written. So 
just some th quick thoughts on that. So just to wrap up, um, I think the main thing to leave you with is this idea of building a profile. Um, some of the things we've talked about already today have been how to use social media for that. Um, I'd say the key is making it work for you. Um, Twitter can be a wonderful place, it can be a completely horrible place. Um, fortunately, not had bad experiences on Twitter myself. I've seen that, um, that happening to other people though, and depending on your area of research, you may or may not want to engage too much in certain areas of Twitter. Um, LinkedIn, obviously useful from the point of view of professional networking. Um, Facebook, a range of groups can be useful for advertising events and becoming aware of events that you may want to get involved in. So Bioethics International, Health, Ethics and Law, um, a wider grouping, regulation, governance and public policy, again, as an interest in health related themes. So I'm going to leave it there for now and leave us to move on to questions. We have to take questions now or outside of this forum as well. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Mary, uh, and again to Simon for that. Um, colleagues, please don't hesitate to write your questions uh, into the chat box. Um, I might get us started just to, to a question to pose to you both. Uh, Simon, you mentioned that you had a, a career for, for a decade as a cancer nurse. So I wonder, when you were both starting out in your university career and going through post undergraduate and postgraduate study, I take it perhaps that there wasn't necessarily a linear path to saying, I definitely want to be an academic. Um, what were those experiences like for you in terms of how you came about to land uh, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a career academic, it's particularly for Simon, given it was more curvilinear than a linear path for you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, sp I suppose um, I, I had I had rather unusual kind of profile of um, having a philosophy degree and also being qualified as a nurse and spending time working as a nurse it provoked me even more to think about the everyday ethical issues that I was encountering and I and I think you know I, I turned to academia as a way of <laughs> naively finding some space to think about the issues that I just did not have time to think about when I was working shifts and running a running a bone marrow transplant unit as it was when I when I left the clinical work um, and a slightly rude awakening when I got in academia and realized that actually uh, there's a lot of things that take up your time there too and don't give you necessarily time to think but 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 I think what I wanted to say about that was that uh, you know, working in bioethics might not be being an academic. You know, I've worked with many health professionals who, I mean, I did think about doing a kind of profile of different people who've been through Peel's, but out of recent um, PhD successes, you know, my last PhD student has returned to medical training. Um, you know, he did a fantastic PhD, but now he's he's back into uh, finish, finishing off his training as a doctor. And we've had somebody who, you know, somebody who's a principal genetics counselor who did a, a fantastic piece of work for her PhD. So people might come into the bioethics field or kind of take it with them to another area of professional work. So I think that's what I wanted to emphasize that it isn't just one linear trajectory towards the, you know, the goal of being the permanent academic, but obviously many people who do a PhD entertain the ambition and the idea that, the, that um, a permanent post in academia is where they'd like to end up. But I would just encourage in the time it takes to develop a career to also think of other exit strategies, because actually there might be other careers that I would still say broadly are related to bioethics, but um, um, give different opportunities. Mary, did you want to come in there and share some of your own kind of pathway to... Uh... Into, into academia, yeah, um, certainly. Um, yeah, I mean, my background is um, somewhat unusual. So um, 
I started out as a translator in the civil service and moved into academia from there. Um, essentially, I found I was translating a lot of law and policy documents and I was more interested in sort of the research that had gone into them than the actual sort of translating of them after the event. So that was, I ended up doing a law conversion course and then one thing led to another. I ended up on a master's program and then doing a PhD. So um, having had a sort of um, non-traditional route into, or back into academia, I should say, um, I, I, I found that helped with focus enormously, enormously having had that sense of working a 40 hour week that's helped enormously with the structure of discipline for the PhD. What also helped was um, the sense of knowing who might be interested in your research, having had that sort of exposure to a sort of policy audience beforehand, understanding how policy can be used in government. So, um, so that's proved very helpful. But I think uh, Simon's made a very important point. I mean, just as with bio, I think so too with health law, there would be um, other avenues available outside academia. Obviously, that's I'm not going. To, that's not something we're talking about here necessarily. But um, the, there could be scope to to see where what other opportunities may be available beyond the sort of um, yeah the, the uh, academic trajectory. Thank you. Thanks both. And just um, another kind of question that maybe builds on, on that one you just asked. Would you have any recommendations for publication outlets, thinking in particular about uh, where budding, budding academics or, or others who want to build a career in bioethics and health law might publish, particularly thinking about research impacts uh, and or public engagement, which <clears throat> outlets might be appropriate in that area. And then I see um, Magdalena has got a question too, and Amory has got a question another Emory, so we'll, we'll turn to those questions too. I, I think for publication, um, what I've tried to do and encourage my colleagues to do is to consider different kinds of out, outlet, if you like. The, there's no doubt that um, the assessment of academic research output is forcing us to be um, much more focused on where we choose to to publish because and, you know the ref is making us be more blinkered I think in thinking about publication but what I've tried to do is to always have the academic publication in the bag and then look to other avenues for work that might have a wider readership or more or more impact with the audiences that you want to have impact with. So, I mean, you know, I've, I, I, I've published in medical journals um, as well as philosophy journals or bioethics journals. Um, and I think, I think there's value in that, but I do understand that there's pressure now to be highly selective about those publications. But I think if you think about the other, other avenues, we've mentioned blogs, discussion pieces, journalism, if it's, if it's, if it's possible, and this is where my juggling, juggling octopus comes in. If, it, you know, if, if it's possible to develop the skill to do that, then I think it's a more rewarding um, way of developing one's career, but, but it, it's also important because I think for, 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 for bioethical issues, it's not the exclusive domain of the ivory tower. It's, it's, it's for public digestion and discourse. Um, you know, the Peel's logo uh, on my slide of the speech bubbles, we thought that up because we wanted to bring different voices to the table. And, that's, and I think that should be reflected in a, a publishing strategy. But for early career researchers, get the academic publication in the bag first and then think about the other outlets. Next, maybe. Oh. Mary, did you want to come in there? Uh, yeah, just in terms of sort of a, a, a mixed outlets. Um, so obviously, there's the um, sort of medical law journals um, that can be focused on, but um, alternatives um, or wider groupings maybe in connection. Um, 
I'm thinking about sort of parliamentary type work, um, you can reach out to groups like the All Parliamentary Health Group, for example, they're very interested to hear from academics and both at, at all career stages. So just seeing what alternatives may be available there, but um, it's obviously there is um, a great deal of pressure to sort of reserve your best ideas for referable work. So. I see, maybe we'll go to Amory's question, uh, Amory Nornbrock's question. Do you know students from non-UK countries who successfully managed to get jobs outside of academia? So for example, public health roles for the NHS uh, within the UK. <clears throat> um, I mean, I know, I know of people who successfully done this in, in NGOs or, um, non-formal um, organizations but, but but equally I mean I think it's possible to to um, it's certainly possible to get to get these jobs I think <laughs> the unfortunate position of the UK now is that we've become xeno so xenophobic that it's virtually impossible for anybody to get a job um, um, from outside the UK, um, so unfortunately, but that's a very recent turn. But yeah, it certainly is possible to do that. I think, I mean, certainly if you've developed that diverse skill set and uh, um, a portfolio of of skills that I was talking about, then that makes it more more uh, easy to do that. But equally, I mean, organisations are interested in people who have got training, uh, you know, legal training, for example, or research training, which you might get in social sciences, um, are very um, valuable, I think, assets. Um, yeah. Mary, any, any other thoughts? I'm afraid I don't have anything further to add to that on that one. Well, let's go to a question from Magdalena. I know Anne-Marie's responded to, to it with her own experience, but I'll, I'll pose it to both of you. So Magdalena asks uh, about monographs. Um, I've heard from, from a few senior people that your time might be better spent publishing several good peer reviewed journal articles rather than writing a monograph. Uh, and Magdalena wonders if you have any opinions on that. Yeah. Well, the monograph versus uh, <clears throat> individual articles is um, a moot point in relation to the ref. It, it, it's, it's awful, but the fact is that a monograph might only count the same as a, as a, um, a journal article. Uh, in terms of outputs, but the, I mean, one can't ignore the 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 metricization of academia. But but also, if you've got a good book in you, why not write a book? Um, it's not it it's not going to harm you. It's just that you will have to work extra hard to get the get the papers on the side. Um, but I think, as Mary said, that uh, some PhDs, for example, lend themselves to a monograph rather than uh, multiple publications. And there is a trend in some places to move towards PhD by publication. And that's also speaking to the fact that, that, public, that having a portfolio of publications at the end of a PhD is already um, giving you that kind of uh, portmanteau um, to carry around with you. But, um, you know, books are important. Um, it, it's it, it's a call, I think, based on the evaluation of different factors. If you're thinking about your PhD, as I, as Mary says, some PhDs could be easily converted into a book. Others lend themselves more to uh, individual publications. Mary, did you want to? Yeah, just to um, reinforce that. Really, I think it's it's a very personal decision. I understand. I've also heard that um, advice from senior colleagues as well. Um, in my case, um, the people, when I was a PhD student, the people I looked up to and respected had all gone down the route of producing monographs. It was simply what they'd done. But it does come down to what you're researching, how it fits together, uh, whether, um, I mean, with my monograph, it was published two or three years after I'd um, completed my PhD. Um, I was a lecturer at that point, I didn't have a period as postdoc, but um, that gave, gave enough time to sort of make it turn a PhD into a book, as it were, as, a, to sort of, as two separate things, right? PhD as a piece of work that's being examined for a degree, and a book that hopefully 
people will want to read. So um, it, it, it's just such a personal decision. Um, but Simon's absolutely right. Um, there, there are con considerations from a ref perspective. It's not necessarily the case that a, a monograph will be double weighted or anything like that. So in the sense, it's requiring you to produce more work, but a monograph can have benefits beyond the ref, as I mentioned, uh, for example, when it comes to applying for funding, indicating what you've done, what you've contributed, so. <clears throat> Thank you both. I don't see any other questions coming through. I see Emery uh, uh, continue to offer some tips in the chat box, which is great. Simon and Mary, thank you uh, both very much for that excellent uh, final presentation on perhaps the most um, <clears throat> stressful or daunting aspect, I think, for many people participating today, which is what do I do with my degree? Where do I go in terms of career development? But I, I hope that uh, the, the insights you provided have been helpful to, to everyone who's joined us today. Um, I want to draw this two-day session to a close by thanking all of our uh, eight speakers over the past uh, yesterday and today for their excellent uh, delivery of these four sessions. And I hope you as participants have found them helpful, uh, insightful, inspiring, and so on. Um, stay tuned because these are recorded. We'll make sure that they're up on the Mason Institute website um, so that you can view them later on um, and return to them as you, as you wish. I want to thank the Law Events team for helping organize this, uh, uh, Katrina McMillan and Rebecca Richards for helping out with that, and of course, Henry Farrell for uh, helping out with the uh, chat so over the last couple of days. Amory, do you want to have any, any words to, to close with? Not to put you on the spot. Okay, thanks, Amory. Well, thanks again for all of your, your, your good participation uh, uh, over the past two days. And of course, you know, the ideal would be to have this take place in Edinburgh, but I suppose if there is any upside to this being virtual is that we can normally have much better participation numbers because it involves no travel. But uh, I still think the ideal would be uh, Edinburgh in the springtime, but here's hoping uh, in future years we can make that mm -hmm. happen. So. Thanks again to Simon and to Mary, and thanks again for all of your great participation of the last uh, couple of days. If you have any questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out to me, to Amory, and anyone in the Mason Institute, or I'm sure uh, all of our great colleagues who have offered to give their time. If you have more questions about career progression, publishing articles, and anything else, I'm sure we're all happy to help you out on your journeys. So thanks again. Take good care, everyone.